Uh, my name's Itai Man. I'm the current president as of the 2018-2019 school year of the Video Game Development Club. And my interests are m making video games and a couple other things that get not enough time because school and games eat up all my time. Um, so when I was younger, I pretty much, I'm a person who, if I enjoy something, I really can't see myself not doing that thing as a job. Um, so at some point during high school, I think I just said, I'm gonna be a game developer. Um, I think it was because I watched a lot of like Halo 3 vid docs and I saw like this big dark room of Bungie devs at the time. And I was just like, wow, games are made by people. Who would have thought? Um, and I think at that point I was just like, yeah, I'm gonna do that. Cause that seems like fun. I like games, I'll make games. It's been downhill ever since. <laughs> um, so I joined VGDC because I worked on a project freshman year with a guy named Brad Guerrero, who as of talking about this is at Amazon Game Studios. Um, and I was walking around in DBH one day, sophomore year, and sophomore year I left the dorms, kind of had a very small group of friends, didn't really know where I was going, didn't really know what I was doing. And Brad just happened to be there, and Brad is like, sup dude? And he pulled me into the game lab, and then uh, I, I kind of never left. Um, as for becoming an officer, I kind of just was in the game lab a lot. Um, stayed late, hung out, talked with a lot of officers, was on teams with multiple officers for my first game project with the club and my first game jam. Um, and eventually some of the officers just kind of looked at me and were like, hey, you, you seem cool. Um, and they kind of made me a lab officer at the time, which isn't a thing that happens anymore. But then when, uh, when program, when the officer signups rolled around, I was kind of starting to get interested into this concept in programming called shaders, or it's a technique, I guess, or subfield. And the programming director at the time, Derek, is a nutso graphics programmer. That dude lives and breathes graphics programming. And I think they saw that like, hey, he's loyal to the club, he likes the club, he likes being here, he wants to teach people, and he also wants to teach people this thing that no one else knows. Um, so, hey, you know, he's a good fit and they brought me on as a programming officer. And then, you know, a year goes by and the club is kind of in a weird spot. Like, it's kind of floating along and I think at some point me and a couple other people, specifically Claudia, uh, who was art director last year and ran a ton of stuff, pretty much were like, hey, we need to do this, 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 and this. And we kind of just started running, and Claudia graduated, so they were like, ah, who's Claudia's second in command? Itai was Claudia's second in command, so um, they pretty much put me as president, and I've been having like stress and panic about it ever since, so that's how I got here, I guess. Um, so, social and career, I'll split this into two. Social-wise, it's a very good social space for people who are very serious about games. I found that a lot of game social spaces tend, tend to kind of carry, I don't want to use the word toxic, but elitist overtones. Um, they're just not that welcoming to some people. And sometimes it's very much like, hey, you suck at this game, go sit over there at the child's table. We don't do that. We welcome everyone of every skill level. We are friendly, our lab is always open. We don't think less of you because of this or that. We welcome you, we wanna teach you, we wanna get you up to speed and understand this concept that everyone kind of interacts with but no one really has an understanding of how or why. And then on the career side, yo, like, it's projects. Um, game companies really, really do look for projects. I remember a game company at a fall recruiting fair one year and one of the recruiters was looking at all these CS kids uh, resumes. And literally at one point, the guy was like, you don't have any game projects on here, we're going to toss out your resume if you give it to us. So like from a career oriented standpoint, like especially if you want to do games, it's like, hey, look, this is a project class or a club. This is a career club. You will get stuff that you can show to your employers. On top of that, it's just a good place for like you to learn certain skills like Git, GitHub, which as of this recording, the school doesn't touch as much as I think they should. And then there's other things like, hey, like I learned a lot of 
I, I use Windows, but I love Linux, and I've learned a lot of Linux stuff through this club. I've learned a lot of programming stuff through this club, stuff that the school would have never taught me. So I think from a social aspect, it's like, hey, it's super welcoming and inviting and surrounded by, I think, some of the best people I've ever met and some of the hardest working people ever, like the people in the club are nuts. And then from a career oriented standpoint, it's like, hey, it's projects, it's networking, it's learning new skills that you might have never came across. So that's why I think everyone should join this game dev club. Or not everyone, because I can't manage like <laughs> 40,000 people at UCI, but you know, I think, especially if you're, if you're CGS, I think you should join this club. Oh God, oh, I'm trying, there's so many. <laughs> Um, you can give more than one if it's too hard to decide. <laughs> uh, when I was on my first project, my first year I was like a lab officer. I wasn't even a lab officer yet. I was uh, stuck in what we called the Pattis Trap, which was, you know, you're taking 46 and trying to do a game team at the same time. And my team lead was Tina. Um, and Tina was also in 46 with me. And we kind of were just like trapped in 46 and I think... It was so bad that at one point Tina just started walking into the lab and was like, Hey, Itai, where's my game? And I was like, I don't know, ask Chris, who was the vice president at the time. And she's like, you're fired. Cue months and months and months of her walking in asking me, Hey, where's my game? And she just, if I said anything but here you go, it was essentially like, Itai, you're fired. <laughs> um, it used to be, another memory was, it used to be on Friday nights, they play D&D in the lab. Um, at the time, I didn't like D&D, &D, um, and I would essentially sit down with a guy who was playing D&D, &D, but was actually there to beat me up in fighting games and Puyo Puyo Tetris. Um, so I would show up, sit down, and be like, yeah, let's, let's play some Guilty Gear or something, and then he'd just mop the floor with me with like the most like guerrilla nonsense tactics, and I'd just be like, man, I... <laughs> ah! Um... There's a lot of other great moments. Um, a lot of last year, which was like this weird, like, haha, camaraderie, kind of like, let's do this. Um, recently, like kind of putting stuff in order for like, hey, you know, the club is gonna survive like past me. Um, well, of course it would, I'm, I'm a cog, I'm like gonna bounce down the street. But like, there's just a lot of like small moments. My first game jam, that was a really good memory. Um, my first summer game jam, us putting on game jams, um, going out to Korean barbecue afterwards for like most events, that was super great, that's always fun. Um, meeting people like Mayan and Greg and Vincent and all these other people who are just fucking phenomenal. Um, learning art, I pretty much learned art through the club, Maya, uh, Krita. I'm not a good artist, um, I'm an awful artist. But knowing and understanding how these tools work, um, there's just so much. Like, my life has literally... Oh, uh, staying in the lab until 1 a.m. every day. That was fun. Uh, I used to stay in the lab every single day until, like, 1 a.m. with this dude named Trey. And Trey is a degenerate, um, and it would be very fun. I would not do that now, <laughs> um, but... He, that was that was a lot of fun times. They uh, they used to call me and him the new Kang, and I don't remember his name because there were people who previously would used to like literally sleep in the lab, just casually. Um, I never did that. I don't want to do that. That that room is filthy. But yeah, no. It, there's just too many memories. Like they're all super strong, and they're all like kind of blended together into this giant mush of like, well, that's VGDC. So. It's, it's been really fantastic. It's weird to say this because I don't think it actually affected me as much as I think it did, but Hotline Miami, um, that game, I've made a lot of top-down 2D shooters in my time, um, and that game is phenomenal. Halo 3, that game, just like, bar for like a lot of different things in my life. Like, I think, Sonic Adventure 2 is like shitty, but really, uh, really charming. I can't really think of, I think Spider-Man, uh, Spider-Man on PS4, that game looks beautiful and I've, I've just started getting into like texturing and modeling and doing a lot of that stuff. And to see how they did certain things in that game and the way that they did certain things, it's just like mind blown. Like, oh, like this is the end result. This is the goal. Like that's where I'm, that, that's where I should be and I should be past that too. Um, so Spider-Man was definitely an inspiration.
And then just like other like kind of silly stuff. Like I think I'm trying to think what else. Uh, whew, what other games do I pull from one? A lot of just like general like action games. Like I love uh, Metal Gear Rising. I love Bayo. Like anything from Platinum, I essentially love to death. Fighting games, although I never make one. Um, see Tina interview for that one <laughs> if she brings it up. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's a lot of like inspiration from like kind of actiony. Like more often than not, they're from Japan. Um, kind of style action games that's like most of it and a bit of indie games here and there like, like I said earlier Hotline Miami and all that I would like to work <laughs> Stay <laughs> staying in Orange County would be nice I would love to work for Blizzard um, I think that the way they treat their developers at least from what I understand in terms of like hey we don't really do crunch fantastic um, I would love to work at In Exile I'd love to work at Obsidian um, initially, I one of my goals when I left the school was to, hey, go work in Montreal, because um, I just think it's a cool city. So any of the studios in Montreal, uh, Eidos Montreal, Mon uh, Ubisoft Montreal, um, just generally like, hey, you know, Montreal's a cool city and there's cool games out there. I would love to work on a Japanese game, but crunch culture plus what I understand about the Japanese work-life balance, it's... It, it, also, it's a language I don't speak, so it would be very tough to adjust, and I've kind of written that off the list in terms of, like, where I would want to work. It's a lot of, like, hey, you know, y'all make, like, like, I think I'll be happy working on pretty much any game, like, any console game, like, serious console or PC game, I will be happy to work on. Um, sorry, mobile. <laughs> and casino games, and, like, a, a, like handhelds. Just really want console and PC. Um, what's your Hogwarts house? <laughs> if you know it. <laughs> Muggle. Okay. <laughs> That's a valid answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you were stranded on an island, what three essential things would you want to have with you? You want the dark answer or the real answer? Um, whichever. I don't know. Um... One would think that the dark answer would be the realist answer. Yeah, that is the realist answer. Shoot. <laughs> um, that's a pretty hopeless situation. Okay. Um, maybe, like, the fun version of the answer. The fun version of the answer? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd probably want a... Oh, God, what's the name of it? I'd probably want, like, a basketball or a tennis ball to kind of treat, like, uh, stranded or what is it, Castaway? The movie with Tom Hanks on the boat, or on the on the island and he just befriends this like volleyball. Um, I'd probably want that because I could see myself going nuts without talking to anyone. Although if you're talking to a ball, you're probably a little bit nuts. Um, <laughs> dang, what else? Food, obviously. Um, probably some kind of knife, I'd imagine. Just like figuring it out, like, hey, you know, I gotta cut these things. And, uh, you know, a cell phone, so I can call my friends to pick me up when I'm sick and tired of this. Right, okay. <laughs> um, if you had, if you could have one superpower, what would it be? Um, I want the ability to eat any food and be able to immediately determine the calorie count and what's in it. That's my superpower. <laughs> so I can feel bad about all the <laughs> shitty food I eat. Um, can you tell us about your cat? <laughs> Cleo's the best. Um, she's not technically my cat, she's my brother's, but my cat Cleo showed up in our backyard one day, like out of nowhere, um, and she just started meowing at us. She literally would not stop. She would meow at us and meow at us through our glass screen door, and she's just like, I want food, give me food. We thought, um, for a while, we thought like, oh, maybe she's gonna bite us or something, but we'd go outside and she'd just like start like being like, do you have food? And she'd like kind of headbutt us and do the cat, like, I'm being nice, now give me food. Um, and she would not stop meowing. We had a, a, a window in our kitchen and the, the air conditioning unit was outside and she hopped on the air conditioning unit to see us through the window and just meow at us even more. 
And at some point my brother was just like so, I don't know if he was sick and tired of the meowing or if he was just like, like actually feeling bad because like it's hard to read him. Sorry, Roy. Um, but at some point he just started feeding the, the, the cat bread. And at some point my dad was like, okay, we need to take this animal to the shelter and figure out the, the cat was microchipped. And they were like, okay, two weeks. Give the owners two weeks to show up and take their cat back. Owners were like from a place that was like an hour by drive away. Like that was their address. And they couldn't find, the, the owners had like no phone number. They had to do like, like snail mail. Um, at some point, uh, essentially what ends up happening is like, hey, the two weeks are up, we can adopt Cleo now. And then we go and my dad, the, the shelter by my area is very specific. My dad says indoor outdoor cat. They didn't give him any prior warning. He is now blacklisted from uh, getting cats at that uh, shelter because they do not let you do indoor outdoor, only indoor. Um, so then my brother and mom had to go and essentially pretend that they were divorced. My mom was divorced from my dad uh, and lived in a separate house. And then they learned that, oh, Cleo has been moved to like a pet store, like 30 to 40 minutes away. And long story short, my brother eventually gets the cat and Cleo comes home and she is the best. She is like such a little shit. Um, she's lovely. She will essentially cuddle with you, but if you try to pet her, she'll bite you. Um, she's like, she, you know exactly what she's thinking and what she wants at all times. Like some cats, I've seen some cats and they really don't have much going on behind, like in their brain. Like they're just like, you know, they're, they're response animals. They're just walking and they'll hit a wall and then they'll be like, Rah! and run away. <laughs> but with Cleo, it's like, you walk into, she'll walk into your room and she'll just meow at you and hop on the bed and then she wants hugs. And then you try to hug her and she's like, no, don't hug me. Let me hug you. I love her a lot. She's the best. She's the best cat. I'm so happy we got her. That's awesome. And can you tell us about your hat? I bought my hat. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take the hoodie off. Um, I bought my hat because, and let's take the hat off so I can prove a point. I'm going bald, like really obviously. Um, pretty much every man, both on my dad and mom's side, is bald. Male pattern baldness, it's in the genes. I'm just gonna get it. I've accepted that. Um, the one thing I haven't accepted is that like, hey, with a bald ass head, it's probably cold and you have to use sunscreen. Um, I'd rather just not. So, essentially, I bought the hat, and it was literally like a $10 hat off of Amazon, and I was like, that seems okay. And I bought it, and I wasn't feeling it for a little bit, and then I walked in one day, and Josh Wardlaw, who was a design officer at the time, looked at me, and he was like, I didn't recognize you because of the hat. And I was like, okay. And then somehow the hat just became a part of like my like visual identity. Um, and then when we got these pins, I was pretty much, I also always liked the visual of a pin on a hat. I thought it was just like a nice little thing to spruce up. Uh, and I've been wearing this pin ever since I got it. Um, so the hat just became a part of my identity, a lot like how the facial hair and glasses did. Um, and it kind of creates a cohesive look that's like recognizable, but simultaneously really generic in a weird way. Um, but yeah, that's essentially how I got my hat. I bought it on Amazon. It got delivered to my house and I wore it and I haven't stopped wearing it. I need to buy a new one too, cause uh, like I'll be honest, like it, like I don't know if the color's coming through, but like that's the color it's supposed to be, and this is like the worn out color it is. <laughs> I've worn it for like two years. I've tried washing it. It does not wash. It's like people are like, Isai, are you gonna leave your hat in the lab when you leave? And I'm like, you don't want this hat. You don't want it. Like, let it die. I'll throw this hat out at some point. I'll get a new one. It's fine. But it's iconic. It is iconic. <laughs> it is iconic. Thank you.